Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the biology topics. This is living things and cells. We're going to begin by looking at the characteristics of living things. Beginning with movement, living things carry out either whole body movement or parts of the body. Like in plants we do see growth movements. And uh, going to respiration, of course all living things carry out respiration, which is the breakdown of food particles in order to release energy in the form of ATP from cells. Respiration can be aerobic or anaerobic, like we're going to talk about it later. So like in plants, the food substances made in the chloroplast are going to be transported into the mitochondrion, where respiration is going to take place, generating ATP, and this is going to be used for cellular processes. Living things are sensitive to stimuli. This could be internal or external. An example we see here, light sensitivity in plants. Plants grow towards light, that is because they have response towards the stimulus, which is going to be light. When an animal steps on something sharp, it's going to move immediately. Since we have receptor cells that convert that stimulus into nerve impulses that are sent to the brain, there is going to be response towards that specific stimulus. And in some organisms, these responses allow them to be able to detect food, detect mates, and so on. Going on to growth, single-celled organisms just increase in size because it's just a single cell, so initially it's smaller, and as it absorbs more substances, it creates more organelles and it increases in size. But for multicellular organisms, they produce more cells, become more complex, increase in size, change shape, like we can see here. This is a seed that is planted, watered, it grows, produces more cells to produce a younger plant, and over time, many cells are going to be produced, they become specialized to become different body cells, and uh, there is going to be complexity that is attained as the organism matures. Next we go to reproduction. Single-celled organisms just divide, producing more cells. For example, in bacteria we see the binary fusion, where one cell divides to produce two different cells, and so on. But most cellular organisms produce offsprings. This could be through sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, there is exchange of gametes, meaning there is a male and a female. But in a sexual reproduction, we produce offsprings that are genetically identical to the parent. All living things carry out excretion. For example, in animals or in humans, excretion can occur through the skin, where sweat is going to come out releasing ions like sodium chloride out of the body. Also, it's going to occur through the gaseous exchange system, where carbon dioxide is going to be taken out of the body, and it could occur through the kidneys, where urea is going to be passed out, as well as some excess salts that are not necessary in the body. So these are the major excretory organs, the kidneys, the lungs participate in that, as well as the skin. All living things carry out nutrition. Plants are autotrophic, so they get their source of carbon from carbon dioxide in the environment or in the atmosphere with the help of sunlight. Other organisms could be heterotrophic, meaning those that feed on the autotrophs, meaning feeding on the plants or other animals. Those that feed on other organisms could also be saprophytes, meaning saprotrophic nutrition where organisms release enzymes and then external digestion takes place. Then the products of digestion are absorbed back into the cell to be used during respiration. Moving on to levels of organization, we begin with cells, then we go to tissues. A tissue is a group of cells that are similar, working together to perform the same function. And then after tissues, a group of tissues working together to perform a similar function that makes an organ. And then an organ system is made up of multiple organs working together to perform a specific function. So beginning with the animal cell, like the example I drew here, the animal cell has a cell membrane. This is the cell surface membrane and it's partially permeable. The purpose is to control the movement of substances into and out of the cell. For example, oxygen enters into the cell for aerobic respiration and then carbon dioxide can leave the cell. Also glucose and other substances that are needed in the cell are going to enter through the membrane and then the waste products are going to pass out of the membrane. Then it contains the nucleus. This is where the genetic material is contained and the genetic material controls the reactions that take place in the whole cell. There is a cytoplasm. This is where most organelles are formed. And in these organelles, that's where some cellular reactions do occur. Of course, there are some cellular reactions that occur within the gel-like structure itself, which is the cytoplasm. We have the mitochondria. This is where aerobic respiration takes place, meaning oxygen is going to be reacted with glucose to give us carbon dioxide and water with vast amounts of ATP being generated. And the ATP is useful in the cellular processes, like cell division and so on. 
Moving on to the plant cell, this is the example we see here. The plant cell is made up of a cell membrane. This is partially permeable and it controls the movement of substances into and out of the cell. Then we go to the nucleus, of course it contains genetic information like we saw already, and the DNA controls the reactions that take place within the cell, reactions like protein synthesis and so on. It contains a cytoplasm where cellular reactions take place, and the cytoplasm contains some organelles where reactions do take place as well. The organelles provide conditions unique for specific reactions to take place without interference in the general processes that occur within the cytoplasm. The mitochondria are organelles where aerobic respiration takes place, then we go to the cell wall, this is made up of cell laws, and its purpose is to strengthen the cell. We have the chloroplast, where photosynthesis takes place, and then we have the permanent vacuole. This contains pigments and ions, which we usually call the cell sap, and it helps in the movement of water across the cell. For example, if there is a higher concentration in here, then more water is going to enter the cell, and the cell is going to become turgid to maintain its structure, so that the plant structures can be held in the right position, meaning the stem can stay upright, the leaves can be displayed well in order to maximize the process of trapping sunlight for photosynthesis to occur. In comparing the animal and plant cells, we look at components found only in plants. Plants contain a cell wall, it's not found in the animal cell. Plants do contain chloroplasts and they do contain permanent vacuoles. Both plant and animal cells do contain a nucleus. They contain the cytoplasm, cell membrane, organelles and so on. The other components we've not talked about are ribosomes. These are present in the cytoplasm and this is where protein synthesis takes place. And then the chromosomes, of course these are found in the nucleus of both plant and animal cells and they contain the genes. Remember the genes determine the characteristics or features of organisms, for example, they can determine in humans your hair color, your eye color and so on. These are found in the nucleus and they make up your DNA. So this brings us to the end of this video about living organisms and cells. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.